Hi everyone, welcome back to this video on Server 20, 2012. How, how dynamic DNS populates the DNS database. TCP IP is the protocol used for network communications on a Microsoft Windows Server 2012 or 2 network. Users have two ways to receive a TCP IP number static. Administrators um, manually enter the TCP IP information dynamic using DHCP. When, ad when an administrator sets up TCP IP, DNS can also be configured. Once a client gets the address of the DNS server, if that client is allowed to update with DNS, the client sends a registration to DNS or requests DHCP to send uh, the registration. DNS then does one of two things, depending on which dynamic update um, option is specified. Check with Active Directory to see whether that computer has an account secure only updates. And if it does, enter the record into the database enter the record into the database, non-secure and secure updates. What if you have clients that cannot update DNS? Well, there is a resolution, DHCP. In the DNS tab of the IPv4 properties window, check the option labeled dynamically update DNS A and PTR records for DHCP clients that do not request updates. For example, clients running Windows NT 4.0, which is shown in figure 2.4. DHCP along with dynamic DNS clients allow an organization to update its DNS database dynamically without the time and effort of having an administrator manually enter um, the DNS records, DNS queries. As stated earlier, a client can make three types of queries to a DNS server, recursive, inverse, and iterative. Um, remember that the client of a DNS server can, uh, can be a resolver, what you'd normally call a client or another DNS server. Um, interrative queries. Interrative queries are the easiest to understand. A client asks the DNS server for an answer and the server returns the best answer. This information likely comes from the server's cache. The server now sends out an, out an additional query in response to an iterative query. If the server doesn't know the answer, it may direct the client to another server through a referral. Recursive queries. In a, recur in a recursive query, the client sends a query to a name server asking it to respond either with the requested answer or with an error message. The error states one of two things. The server can't come up with the right answer. The domain name doesn't exist in a recursive query. The name server isn't allowed just to refer the client to some other name server. Most resolvers use recursive queries. In addition, if your DNS server uses a forwarder, the requests sent by your server to the forwarder will be recursive queries. Figure 2.5 shows an example of both recursive and iterative queries. In this example, a client within the Microsoft Corporation is querying its DNS server for the IP address of www.whitehouse.gov. So here's what happens to resolve the request. One, the resolver sends a recursive DNS query to its local DNS server asking for the IP address of www.whitehouse.gov. The local name server is responsible for resolving the name and it cannot refer the resolver to another name server too. 
the local name server checks its zones and it finds no zones corresponding to the requested domain name tree. The root name server has authority for the root domain and it will reply with the IP address of the name server for the .gov top level domain for the local name server sends an interactive query to www.whitehouse.gov to the golf name server 5. The golf name server replies with the IP address of the name server servicing the whitehouse.gov domain 6. The local name server sends an interactive query for www.whitehouse.gov to the whitehouse.gov name server 7. Whitehouse.gov name server replies with the IP address responding to www.whitehouse.gov 8. The local name server sends the IP address of www.whitehouse.gov back to the original resolver. Inverse queries. Inverse queries use pointer PTR records instead of supplying a name and then asking for an IP address. The client first provides the IP address and asks for the name because there's no direct correlation in the DNS namespace between a domain name and its associated IP address. This search will be fruitless without the use of the INADDR.ARPA domain. Nodes in the INADDR.ARPA domain are names are sorry, are named after the numbers in the dotted doctet representation of IP address of IP addresses. However, because IP addresses get more specific from left to right and domain names get less specific from left to right, the order of IP address octets must be reversed when building the in ADDR.ARPA tree. With this arrangement, administration of the lower limbs of the DNS INADDR.ARPA tree can be given to companies as they are assigned their class A, B, or C subnet address, or delegated even further down thanks to the variable length subnet masking VLSM. Once the domain tree is built, into the DNS database, a special PTR record is added to associate the IP address with the corresponding host names. In other words, to find a host name with the IP address 206.131.234.1, the resolver would query the DNS server for a pointer record 1.234.131.206.131. DR.ARPA. If this IP address is outside of the local domain, the DNS server will start at the root and sequentially resolve the domain nodes until arriving at 234.131.206 in ADDR.ARPA, which would contain the PTR record for the desired host. Caching and time to live. When a name server is processing a recursive query, it may be required to send out several queries um, to find the definitive, the definitive answer. Name servers acting as resolvers are allowed to cache all of their received information during this process. Each record contains information called time to live TTL, the TTL specifies how long the record will be held in the local cache until it must be resolved again. If a query comes in that can be satisfied by this cached data, the TTL that's returned with it equals the current amount of time left before the data is flushed. There is also a recursive Sorry, there is also a negative cache TTL. The negative cache TTL is used when an authoritative server responds to a query indicating that the record 
query doesn't exist and it indicates the amount of time that this negative answer may be held. Negative caching is quite helpful in preventing repeated queries for names that don't exist. The administrator for the DNS zone sets TTL values for the entire zone. This value can be the same across the zone or the administrator can set a separate TTL for each RR. Sorry, my nose is itchy. Within the zone, client resolvers also have data checks and honor the TTL value so that they know when to flush. Introducing um, DNS database zones. As mentioned earlier in this chapter, a DNS zone is a portion of the DNS namespace over which a specific DNS server has authority. Within a given DNS zone, there are resource records, R or S, that define the host and other types of information that make up the database of the zone. You can choose from several different zone types. Understanding the characteristics of each will help you choose which is right for your organization. In the following sections, I will discuss the different zone types and the characteristics, understanding primary zones. When you're learning about zone types, things can get a bit confusing, but it's really not difficult to understand how they work and why you would want to choose one type of zone over the other. Zones are databases that store records by choosing one zone type over another. You are basically just choosing how the database works and how it will be stored on the server. The primary zone is responsible for maintaining all of the records for the DNS zone. It contains the primary copy of the DNS database. All record updates occur on the primary zone. You will want to create and add primary zones whenever you create a new um, DNS domain. There are two types of primary zones, primary zone primary zone with Active Directory integration, Active Directory DNS local database. Primary DNS zones get stored locally in a file with the suffix .dns on the server. This allows you to store a primary zone on a domain controller or a member server. In addition, by loading DNS onto a member server, you can help a small organization conserve resources such an organization may not have the resources to load DNS on an Active Directory domain controller. Unfortunately, the local database has many disadvantages. Lack of fault tolerance. Think of a primary zone as a contact list on your smartphone. All of the contacts in the list are the records in your database. The problem is that if you lose your phone or the phone breaks, you lose your contact list until your phone gets fixed or you swap out your phone card. The contacts are unavailable. It works the same way with a primary zone. If the server goes down or you lose the hard drive, DNS records on that machine are unreachable. An administrator can install a secondary zone explained later in this section and that provides temporary fault tolerance. Unfortunately, if the primary zone is down for an extended period of time, the secondary server's information will no longer be valid. Additional network traffic. Um, let's imagine that you were looking for a contact number for John Smith. John Smith is not listed in your smartphone directory but he is listed in your partner's smartphone. You have to contact your partner to get the listing. You cannot directly access your partner's phone contacts. When our resolver sends a request to DNS to get the TCP IP address for J. Smith, in this case, J. Smith is a computer name and the DNS server does not have the answer. It does 
it does not have the ability to check the other server's database directly to get an answer. Thus, it forwards the request to another server. When DNS servers are replicating zone databases with other DNS servers, this causes additional network traffic. No security. Um, okay, staying with the smartphone example, let's say that you call your partner looking for John Smith's phone number. When your partner gives you the phone number over your uh, over your wireless phone, someone with a scanner can pick up your conversation. Unfortunately, wireless telephones, wireless telephone calls are not very secure. Now a resolver asks a primary zone for J Smith TCP IP address. If someone on the network has a packet sniffer, they can steal the information in the DNS packets being sent over the network. The packets are not secure unless you implement some form of secondary security. Also, the DNS server has the ability to be dynamic. A primary zone accepts all updates from DNS servers. You cannot set it to accept secure updates only. So I'm going to leave it here today for this video. If you like this, please consider like sharing and subscribing. Thank you.